Hello and welcome to Mulch, with me your host Rebecca Anning-Brown. This is a weekly podcast for flower farmers who want to build a confident flower farming practice that reflects the lifestyle that you want now and in the future. Each week I'll share conversation and tips to nurture and grow you and your flower farm. I'll open conversations that flower farmers find difficult to talk about, provide approaches that will help you to make decisions, chuckle at the idiosyncrasies of our work, and always be real and honest about my own work as a flower farmer. My goal is to help you to grow a curious, confident and grounded flower farming practice that flourishes as a business that you love and are proud to shout about. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and if you like what you hear please do leave a review and share the podcast with your flower farming friends. It really does help to grow a confident and successful flower farming community. Welcome back to another episode of Mulch. How are you? Have you started seed sowing yet? Do you have your business plan sorted for the year? Are you clear on what you want to earn or charge this season? Okay, I'm starting today with three quick reminders. The first one is that our business planning and pricing for flower farmers workshops are available to download from our website until the end of February. Links are in the notes below and there is a tiny discount if you buy both. So those are there. They will be taken down at the end of February. I just thought I'd give you a little reminder about those. The second thing to say is that our Marketing for Flower Farmers workshop is going to be on Sunday the 11th of February at 9.30 Greenwich Mean Time. I'd love you to join us. We'll be sharing our experience and tips and tricks for Instagram, email, Facebook, YouTube. Um, If you want to hear about podcasting, I can talk about that too. Um, But probably more importantly, in our fast-paced world, I'm going to talk about lots of the old-fashioned methods that are often overlooked in this day and age and are well worth their weight in gold. The third thing for me to remind you about is Flower Farmer Bingo. Now, a few of you have played along and printed things out and popped it in your stories already. Well done. I have to admit that mine are not in the stories because we have no ink in our printer. We have ordered some more. But bear with me, I'm ticking things off. Um, February feels like it's chugging along already, which is slightly scary. Um, But it's fun. Um, What I haven't seen yet is a straight line, a bingo, or a full house. So please do download it. Please do fill it out. Please do pop it in your stories. Please do have a bit of fun in February. That's all it is. So today, I thought I would share my top tips for protecting your flowers or planting your flowers and growing your flowers without a polytunnel. Dun, dun, dun. I feel that's like the most controversial thing that I might say as a flower farmer. Growing without a polytunnel? Are you suggesting that none of us should aspire to have one? Um, listen, there. <laughs> like flower farmers love polytunnels and absolutely they extend the season and they're wonderful things to have. But let, let me share a little bit first about how our setup works at Silvergrave Foliage. So for those of you that don't know, our flower farm is in Leeds, West Yorkshire. So we're in the north of England. We grow in a field that is so completely, like, not perfect. Um, but for this particular example, I'd like to share that we're on an incline across a field with no wind protection, no sun shelter. And when I say no like field protection, it's incredibly windy. Like, it's so, so windy when you're up there on a, like in the winds, in the winds, obviously, um, that sometimes it's a bit scary. And especially when there are those super windy nights we worry about our matting and ground matting and any plastic that's covering the ground and where it might fly off to. So everything is pinned and weighed to the nth degree. So 
I guess the other thing to say is that relative to anyone in the Midlands and the South, it's pretty cold. We don't get a huge amount of frost, but it, it's cold. And so all of our propagation, because we don't live on site, is then done at HQ, so our home site, where we have a family-sized greenhouse and the tiny tunnel. So a family-sized greenhouse is... Uh, 15 foot by 10 foot so it's a standard size family greenhouse and we do have a tunnel so i'm always up front always honest um, we are going into our fifth season we've had it for three seasons so we got it in the winter of 2021 so we use it in winter 21 winter 22 so yes winter 23 is just finished and this is the third time we're using it and I think the other thing to add to that is that last year, for a number of reasons, I only used the tunnel in for early spring. I didn't use it for the rest of the year. And now that is wasted real estate, but there's only so much that I could handle last year. So bearing that in mind that we have a tiny tunnel, so it's eight foot by 20 foot, and it's set up with two long beds down each side that are three foot wide. Like, as tunnels go, that is tiny for a grower. And because I only used it in spring, I cut 1,500 stems from it last year, no more. So to put that into context, last year we cut 80,000 stems here at Silver Grey Foliage. So literally only a tiny proportion came from the tunnel. The remainder were grown outside in our less than ideal field. So my point here is that you don't have to have a tunnel to grow and sell a lot of flowers. And I think the reason that I'm labouring this point is because I know that a tunnel is what we all want to extend our season so that spring starts earlier and autumn finishes later. This is correct. I would love a bigger tunnel and one day we will have a bigger tunnel, but they do come with their own problems and their own nuances and their own set of learning. And I guess my point is that they're not a panacea, they're not essential, they're nice to have. So if you're at the beginning of your career as a flower farmer and you don't have a polytunnel, don't stress about it, just get on and grow. Okay, so I am sharing my top tips on the growing without a tunnel. And tip number one is to treat your flowers mean to keep them keen. And I am talking about flowers, not your partner or potential partner. Um, I'm talking about your seedlings in particular. So you need strong seedlings to cope with growing on outside Molly coddling is not the way forward and I know they're your babies and they're mine too and I promise you I like seed watch is my favorite thing to do and we used to have the propagator in the kitchen on top of a cabinet and I would come down in the morning and the first thing I did wasn't say hello to my kids it was check on the propagator I am a terrible mum I was looking for my seed babies um so yeah, I, I'm, I'm as excitable and as excited about sowing and growing as the next flower farmer. However, soft seedlings make soft plants. Okay, that's a Rebecca-ism. Soft seedlings make soft plants. So what does that mean in practice? It means don't leave them in the propagator forever. It means prick them out when they're small and into modules. It means get them in your sheltered outdoor space to be growing on in a cooler environment as soon as possible and uh, unless you've got significant um pressure from mice or rabbits or deer to get into your greenhouse space or polytunnel if that's what you're using for propagating or the ones that you get from B&Q and home base we have we have those two we don't use them very much anymore but we do have them um, then leave your greenhouse doors open as much as possible. So I only close the doors to our greenhouse, which is where all our seedlings go first, when I can see that the cats from next door are sniffing around a lot or when it's incredibly windy because I don't want to lose my greenhouse. Um, but apart from that, I don't close it very much. So we deter mice with chilli flakes and garlic powder and garlic around the edges. 
and we leave the doors open because that means that our plants get used to the cooler nights, a bit of breeze, the warmer days, which will lead me very, very quickly on to um, what I would call number two. So top tip number two is sow your seeds a little bit later controversial it's the beginning of february we've all been waiting for this moment when the daylight hours are almost 11 hours per day in the uk i'm not sure what it is going around the world but in the uk we're almost at that 11 hour point and that is the time that we get super excited and we start sewing however if you don't have significant protection in your growing space sowing a bit later like the end of february early march is probably a easier not probably definitely a easier and b less worrisome it's it's that simple because it's warmer and the days are longer the seedlings romp away much more quickly they set their roots much more quickly and you can get them in the ground sooner so if you don't have significant protection, starting them a bit later means that they're going into the ground when it's a little bit warmer and the elements aren't quite as mean. Number three, um, I'm back to molly coddling. So if you've kept your doors open on your greenhouse as much as possible, then hardening off your plants is a bit of a luxury. They should be sturdy and hardy because they've got used to the temperatures in your environment. So don't mollycoddle them by popping them in at night and closing the door and tucking them in and popping them outside during the day and letting the fresh air kind of tickle their leaves and then popping, popping them back inside. It's a faff and it's time that you could be spent preparing your beds or having a cup of tea, frankly, or weeding, or contacting your customers. Leave the doors open and it does the job for you. So that's top tip number three. Make your life easy, molly coddle less, fuss less. Um, now, top tip number four is give your plants a chance. By this, I mean don't pinch and plant at the same time. Think about your plant babies like actual babies. Actual babies, like human babies, can't breathe and suck at the same time. That's why when they get snotty, they really struggle. They can't feed. And it's because they can't suck and breathe. And they want to feed and they want to breathe. Quite, yeah, well, that's quite normal. Um, but they can't do both at the same time. And that's why they get so cross. And that's why they get fed up. And that's why they stop feeding because it's too much like hard work. Similarly, with your plant babies, don't pinch them and expect them to be able to bulk out at the same time as you plant them when you're asking them to set roots and, and become stronger in the ground so they can gain their water and their nutrients. It's just mean. They only have enough energy to do one or the other at the same time. So be kind. Personally, um, I like to pinch and then plant out five to seven days later. Um, that's what we do um, because it's easier for my back, if I'm honest. So if I pinch things out on a bench or on a table or in the greenhouse, then I don't have to bend over and kneel along seven metre beds, pinching out hundreds of plants. That's just hard work. So we pinch and then plant Whichever method you choose is up to you, but give your plants a chance. Don't expect them to do everything in one go. Okay, next on to tip number five for the day. Um, cover for the first few days. Now, note I say cover. I'm not saying molly coddle. I am not saying put up a tunnel. Um, we do use low tunnels, but we don't use them on everything, and we mainly use them to keep out rabbits and deer. We're not using them to protect from the weather. A bit of um, EnviroMesh over the top, laid over the top for the first couple of days, is enough. And we do that on our annuals and on our direct seeded plants. So things like Nigella um, the, or Larkspur, they get a covering of... EnviroMesh when they're first getting going 
We will only put a tunnel on it if we're worried about pest pressure, which for us at the moment is a challenge. So we do use lots of low tunnels, but that is the reason rather than the cold. The reason for this is that in reality, you're planting hardy annuals that are supposed to cope with negatives anyway. And by the time you get to February, March, those negatives aren't really very negative very often. So plant them out. They're already hardy. Water them in and trust that they'll be okay. Ah, what is Rebecca? Oh, I mean, I think she's like trying to change the world of growing. I am not trying to change the world of growing. Um, whatever you do, there will be some losses. And it's really important to point that out. Whatever you do as a grower, there will be some losses. So just bear that in mind and plant accordingly. Which leads me on to my sixth and final tip for today, which is grow what you need. So what you need is your number of plants. So whether that's 20, 100, 250, plus a few extra. So you give yourself a percentage of maybe 5% extra. So you need one or two if it's 20. If you're growing 100, you need another five, you know, 250 and so on and so forth. You just give yourself a multiple and a few extra. Now, the reason that I say this is because it is so easy when we're sowing seeds to get overexcited and to fill the little trays or pots, whatever it is that you propagate and germinate in with hundreds of seeds. It's too easy because they're tiny and they don't look like they're all going to do anything. I remember when I first started, and I would just look at these things and go, how on earth am I going to cut flowers from these tiny things? Trust the process. The seeds will germinate and the seeds absolutely will produce flowers and you will be able to cut them and you will be able to sell them. What's your point, Rebecca? My point is the more you grow, the more you have to look after. And if you grow tons more than you need, unless you're planning to sell them or give them away to friends and family, it's just more work. And it's more space taken up in your greenhouse and it's more hunting for slugs um, that is a waste of your time. The other thing is that the fewer seedlings you have to look after, the easier it is to keep them all healthy. There's just no purpose to having thousands of seedlings that you don't need. But because you haven't been able to look after them all so well, having to pick out only a handful of healthy plant babies to go in the ground. So less look after better, plant out more. Okay, that's tips one to six for me from today. And I hope that they're helpful. I hope they help you get your first succession of flowers out into the ground as soon as possible um, in 2024. If you found the podcast helpful, please do share it in your stories. Leave us a rating or a review. It really does help more people to find the show and to therefore be supported to get on and grow don't forget to go to the notes below um, and download flower farmer bingo have a bit of fun like flower farming is a joy it's hard work but it's a joy have some fun in your work hopefully this will help you and as ever if you enjoy the show and you want to support the work that anthony and i are doing please buy us a coffee I'll be back next Monday with another episode of Mulch. Until then, have a fantastic week. Rebecca. Thank you for listening to Mulch. I hope that you found it useful. To find the show notes, head back to our website where you'll find links to all the things that I've been talking about in today's episode. If you're on Instagram, you can find us at Silver Grey Foliage. I would appreciate it so much if you were able to share this episode in your Instagram stories and if you are able to leave a review it really will help more people to get on and grow. I'll be back with you next Monday to talk about more flower farming in practice. Rebecca.